Ever since it was first announced, Star Trek Discovery has been proclaimed to be part of the Prime timeline, taking place one decade prior to the events of the original series. This is something quite a few fans have taken issue with, as Discovery does not appear to line up with canon in any way, shape, or form. However, the makers of Star Trek Discovery are by definition correct. Star Trek Discovery is indeed part of the Prime timeline. What is muddying the waters is that the Prime timeline itself does not mean what the fans were led to believe it means. Midnight's Edge has previously explored the very detailed history and complexity of the Star Trek rights situation. Due to popular demand, we will in this video recap specifically how and why the Prime timeline does not equal the traditional Star Trek canon. This all begins in the aftermath of the fateful 2005 Viacom split, in which the Star Trek rights were taken away from its traditional custodian Paramount and given to CBS for no reason that would stand up to outside scrutiny. Beyond cancelling Enterprise, CBS never had anything to do with Star Trek in the past, and outside of passively collecting the highly lucrative third-party licensing revenue, CBS Chief Executive Officer Les Moonves had no room for more Star Trek in his plans for CBS going forward. While CBS could make more Star Trek but didn't want to, Paramount wanted to but couldn't. Paramount was hurting at the box office at this time and in need of more franchises. Star Trek, the family heirloom that was taken from them in the Viacom split, started looking awfully tempting after Sunder Redstone fired Tom Cruise for his public buffoonery. And I do it the way I do everything. <laughs> There's nothing part of the way for me. <laughs> and thereby ended even the Mission Impossible franchise for the foreseeable future. Mission Impossible 3 director J.J. Abrams and his production company Bad Robot were Paramount's golden boys though. After some convincing of Star Trek's transmedia potential and allegedly being offered a stake in Paramount Star Trek they could not refuse, J.J. and Bad Robot signed on and Paramount arranged a license to make new Star Trek movies from CBS. Please note that everything we have gone through so far is easily verifiable public information. We are now entering the realm of rights and licensing agreements between CBS and Paramount where the details have not been disclosed to the public. However, multiple people in both companies with access to this information have come forward with it. And there are multiple cases of public statements and actions that are consistent with the information that is about to be revealed. However, since the information isn't independently verifiable at this stage, we must advise you to consider it a rumor. Paramount didn't want to revive Star Trek for the box office receipts alone, but to get the previously discussed revenue stream generated by Star Trek licensing flowing again. While CBS did not value Star Trek enough to pursue any more installments of it, they did value the steady stream of revenue that licensed Star Trek merchandise generated, and they were not willing to share any of it with Paramount. Now technically a corporate enemy, albeit one that had the same majority shareholder as them. The solution was to issue Paramount with an alternate Star Trek copyright, which they had to pay extra handsomely for. What they essentially did was to license the creation of an alternative Star Trek, one which visually and tonally was legally required to differ from the original Star Trek enough that the two could be separately licensed for third-party merchandise. This way, CBS would get to keep all licensing revenue based on the likenesses of all ships, uniforms, characters, and designs of the original canon Star Trek, made up to and including Star Trek Enterprise while Paramount would get to keep all licensing revenue based on the ships, uniforms, characters, and designs associated with their alternate Star Trek, which would begin with the 2009 movie. How different do they have to be in order to be separately licensed? The frequently quoted figure is 25% different. We will get back to this figure and its origin in due course. Regardless of how this figure is quantified, the difference manifests itself in different ways. Tonally, the canon Star Trek is slow-paced, reasonably grounded science fiction, while the alternate Star Trek is fast-paced and leans more towards fantasy. The ship designs are more complicated and far bigger in the alternate Star Trek than they ever were in the original canon. To borrow a phrase from Red Letter Media, the characters themselves are electrified. In all the incarnations of the original Star Trek, the uniforms were solid-colored cloth, while the uniforms in the alternate Star Trek are partially watermarked with raised Starfleet Deltas. The one exception is the uniform scene in Star Trek Beyond. On that movie, it was allegedly director Justin Lin and screenwriter Simon Pegg that for creative reasons wanted to get closer to the look and feel of the original series. 
To this end, an additional agreement with CBS was reached, which allowed them to use uniforms of solid color cloth, but in order to qualify as sufficiently different that they could be further licensed to third parties, they had to feature metal badges and metal insignia, another hallmark of the alternate license. Anything from the original canon Star Trek can be separately licensed for use in the alternate Star Trek, but Paramount and Bad Robot do not have resell rights to it, meaning they cannot monetize it by in turn licensing it to a third party. And that licensing revenue is one of the major motivations behind pursuing Star Trek in the first place. One example is the Tribble in Star Trek Into Darkness. Paramount could separately license it and put it in the movie, but only CBS could sell it and profit from cuddly Tribble toys. As such, Paramount and Bad Robot had very little incentive to put anything from the original Star Trek canon, now owned by CBS, into their alternate Star Trek. In addition to being given the license to make an alternate Star Trek, CBS also reportedly agreed that they would not put out any competing Star Trek for a decade while Paramount built their brand. This was an easy agreement for them to make, as not only did Paramount pay a fortune for it, under Moonves, CBS weren't going to make any more Star Trek anyway. It is also heavily rumored that both parties agreed to remain silent about the fact that Paramount's alternate Star Trek is not part of the canon Star Trek, so as not to delegitimize it for the built-in audience. The biggest problem for Paramount and Bad Robot, though, would turn out to be their own mismanagement of the property. As we have covered before, the merchandise based on their alternate license did not sell as expected, and the Kelvin timeline was for all intents and purposes scrapped with the cancellation of Star Trek IV. But Paramount's alternate Star Trek did not begin and end with the Kelvin timeline. On the contrary, that was but one of a myriad of possible timelines within the alternate Star Trek license, as we will explore later. With J.J. Abrams' 2009 reboot, two new terms were introduced to the Star Trek vocabulary, the Prime and Kelvin timelines. Audiences were told and presented with charts which showed that the Prime timeline refers to the original Star Trek canon, while the Kelvin timeline refers to the alternate timeline of the parallel universe which was created when Nero and Spock Prime went back in time in the intro of the 2009 movie. To make that point clear, Paramount and Bad Robot's incarnation of Star Trek does not operate under the Back to the Future rules of time travel, where history is overwritten, but instead it adheres to the multiverse theory, where countless parallel universes exist, and any changes resulting from time travel simply leads to the creation of another timeline in a new parallel universe. Case in point, audiences were initially told that the universe of the Kelvin timeline movies was the same as the prime timeline up until the emergence of the Narada, although this was later retconned to that the destruction of the Kelvin altered that entire parallel universe from beginning to end. The retconned version is more in line with the right situation, as nothing seen in the Kelvin timeline movies has been made under the original CBS Star Trek license, not even the scenes taking place in the prime timeline. That takes us to the crux of the matter. The audience has been conditioned to believe that the prime timeline is identical with the original canon Star Trek from the original series, up to and including Enterprise. This belief, however, is not entirely accurate. For the moment, ignore the different timelines and their names. These are only distractions from the bigger issue, which is that there are ultimately only two different incarnations of Star Trek. One is the original Star Trek license owned by CBS. This consists of all Star Trek released from 1966 up to 2005. Let's call this Star Trek canon. The other is the alternate Star Trek licensed to Paramount and Bad Robot. Within this alternate Star Trek license, Paramount and Bad Robot can make as many different incarnations as they want, they can feature whichever characters they want, and they can explore whichever time frames they want. The most important requirement is that in order for Paramount and Bad Robot to be able to monetize it, whatever they feature must deviate from Star Trek canon by the contractually specified figure which is believed to be 25%. With these two legally separate incarnations of Star Trek established, let us get back to the issue of timelines. Obviously, the Kelvin timeline is a product of the alternate Star Trek. What may be less obvious is that the Prime timeline is also a product of the alternate Star Trek. Star Trek canon was never referred to as Prime until the release of the 2009 Star Trek movie. That was when Paramount and Bad Robot coined the term. Contrary to what you have been conditioned to believe, Prime does not actually refer to the actual Star Trek canon, but rather the alternate Star Trek's representation of Star Trek canon. In order to be monetized, this representation also has to be 25% different from actual Star Trek canon. Case in point, 
Everything from the prime timeline in the 2009 movie, including the USS Kelvin and its crew, as well as Leonard Nimoy's character, Spock Prime, and the storyline about how a supernova destroyed the Romulan homeworld in his native universe, are products of the alternate Star Trek and can be monetized by Paramount and Bad Robot, not CBS, the owners of Star Trek canon. The very terms Prime and Kelvin were invented not so much to keep track of the different continuities, but as a means to legitimize Paramount's alternate Star Trek as a parallel universe to the original Star Trek canon, rather than the completely separate entity that it legally is. To this end, the comic book prequel Countdown, co-written by Alex Kurtzman, was intended to bridge the gap between the Prime and Kelvin universes, although both are products of the alternate license, not the original Star Trek canon. It doesn't matter that the Kelvin timeline is done on film, that was but one timeline. Under their alternate Star Trek license, Paramount and Bad Robot can create as many different universes and continuities as they want, as long as they differ from the original Star Trek canon in accordance with their agreement with CBS. Since the Prime timeline is also a product of the alternate Star Trek, they can even set future movies and a TV series in it, which is precisely what they did with Star Trek Discovery. The entertainment landscape is ever-changing, and by 2017, the switch to digital streaming was in progress, with many networks and corporations wanting to launch their own streaming services. To this end, CBS launched CBS All Access. While Les Moonves had never cared for Star Trek before, it started to look like a suitable property to exploit, and serve as a means to an end for promoting CBS All Access. From what we have been told by people with knowledge of the situation, Discovery Progenitor and original showrunner Brian Fuller did intend for his vision of Discovery to be part of actual Star Trek canon under the original CBS license. However, due to a variety of legal issues and subsequent dealmaking between Moonves and Paramount that was outside of Fuller's control, Discovery had to be made under the alternate Paramount license. Since it was Bad Robot that ran Paramount's Star Trek operation and J.J. Abrams had already jumped the Star Trek ship, it was Alex Kurtzman and his Bad Robot team that were brought over to CBS to oversee development of Star Trek Discovery, now under his ironically named production company, Secret Hideout. We brought in a lot of the same people who worked on the movies to be working on the television show. For Moonves, this was an easy deal to accept. Paramount's involvement meant less CBS personnel being locked up with Discovery. Paramount would take on some of the risk, while CBS would continue to get any and all revenue of the merchandise based on the original Star Trek canon. And most importantly, they would still get the material to promote CBS All Access, which was just about the only thing about Star Trek that Moonves was interested in. For Discovery, this meant lining up with the original Star Trek canon was no longer a priority. On the contrary, only the aspects of the show that are sufficiently different from canon can be monetized. Since it is made under Paramount's alternate license, they could have set the series in the Kelvin timeline if they had wanted to, but in order to avoid creative pitfalls with the movies as well as to win back some of the older fans turned off by them, the decision was made to set Discovery in the Prime timeline, which you will recall is the alternate Star Trek's representation of Star Trek canon, but not actual Star Trek canon. What this means is that despite technically being Prime, Star Trek Discovery does not have to line up with the canon of Star Trek. For Fuller, this meant he lost control over the series to Kurtzman and Moonves, who had a very different vision for the series than he did. The conflict over the look and direction of Discovery was resolved by Fuller being fired and Kurtzman and Moonves getting their way. Their way included going overboard with the redesigns, or as some would say, overdesigns, on ships, creatures, and uniforms. All told, the redesigns were sometimes taken much further than the alleged 25% different from canon, which was a requirement of the alternate license. This 25% figure, by the way, comes directly from John Eaves, one of the designers on Star Trek Discovery. Commenting on why the Enterprise that appears in Star Trek Discovery is three times as big and visually different from the original series Enterprise, Eaves stated that, The task started with the guideline that the Enterprise for Discovery had to be 25% different. And Eves continued, After Enterprise, properties of Star Trek ownership changed hands and was divided. So what was able to cross TV shows up to that point changed, and a lot of the crossover was no longer allowed. That is why when J.J. Abrams' movie came along, everything had to be different. The alternate universe concept was what really made that movie happen in a way as to not cross the new boundaries and give Trek a new footing to continue. These statements are in no way ambiguous. And Eve's description of the situation is consistent with how the right situation has been explained to us, which we are in the process of relaying to you. This is information, however, that neither CBS, Paramount, nor their production arm Bad Robot wants to become public knowledge. 
as that might delegitimize the Kelvin Timeline movies, Star Trek Discovery, and all future Trek made under Paramount's alternate license, which at the time of making this video is literally all planned upcoming Star Trek series. After these comments were first published on comicbook.com, a CBS representative reached out to them and interjected that the designer actually behind the changes had it all wrong and that the design changes were creative, not legal in nature. The article was updated accordingly and a lot of time was spent explaining why Eves was wrong. Here it should be noted that comicbook.com is owned by CBS. Despite this attempt at damage limitation, they were still left with the problem that the Discovery Enterprise is in fact three times as big as the original series Enterprise, which makes it more difficult to sell the notion that these two are somehow supposed to be the same ship. Eves wasn't the only one from the production team that revealed a little bit more than intended. Speaking at the WonderCon Star Trek Discovery panel a couple of weeks earlier, production designer Tamara Deverell explained how they approached the design for the show, saying, For the Enterprise, we based it initially off of the original series. We were really drawing a lot of our materials from that, and then we particularly went to more of the Star Trek movies, which is a little bit fatter, a little bit bigger. Overall, I think we expanded the length of it to be within the world of our Discovery, which is bigger, so we did cheat it as a larger ship. VFX supervisor Jason Zimmerman followed that up by saying, There were a lot of conversations and more emails than I could remember about how the design would evolve and sort of, quote, match our universe. What they are effectively saying is that this is a different enterprise set in another universe than the original series. In order to try to make this go away, an image of the original canon enterprise featuring the original length was separately licensed and displayed on a background screen in an image that was released to the public by way of the CBS-owned comicbook.com. But in addition to the redesign of the Enterprise for Star Trek Discovery, there are multiple other lines of on-screen evidence which suggests that Discovery has more in common with the alternate Star Trek than with the original canon. While anything that appeared in the original Star Trek canon cannot appear in Discovery without being separately licensed, and even that can't be monetized, the Discovery team, which is the bad robot team under another name, can pick and choose whatever they want from the Kelvin Timeline movies, since Star Trek Discovery is made under the same alternate license as them. This is why the Discovery uniforms contain the same raised Starfleet Delta watermarking as the Kelvin uniforms. In Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery, we are introduced to Captain Christopher Pike and the rest of the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Their uniforms are slightly altered versions of the uniforms from Star Trek Beyond. Discovery also features many of the same designers that worked on the Kelvin movies. One example is Neville Page, that designed the Klingons for Star Trek Into Darkness and then redesigned the Kelvin Klingons into the Klingons seen on Star Trek Discovery, where he serves as an alien designer. Meanwhile, both the Star Trek Discovery style Klingons and the new Star Trek Discovery aliens, the Kelpians, have appeared in the Kelvin line of Star Trek comics, which again are part of the alternate Star Trek copyright. In order to explain the obvious departure from the Star Trek canon, as well as the equally obvious similarity to the Kelvin movies, the party line, Star Trek Discovery is a visual reboot, but it's still prime, is a recurring favorite among Discovery's defenders. It might be more appropriate to admit that rather than rebooting the visuals, Discovery instead recycles and refines previous visuals from Kelvin, the earlier incarnation of Paramount and Bad Robot's alternate Star Trek. Star Trek Discovery is technically Prime though, but as we've seen, Prime is not the same as the original canon. The same will be true for the in-development Picard series, which will also be made under the alternate Star Trek license. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Alex Kurtzman revealed that the series will feature a radically different Picard, which is a requirement of the agreement with CBS and take place in the aftermath of the destruction of the Romulan Star Empire, which was alluded to in Spock Prime's recollections in the 2009 movie, as well as in the Countdown comic, both of which were made under the alternate license. More than that, all of the different Star Trek series that have been announced by Alex Kurtzman, whether they ultimately end up seeing the light of day or not, are scheduled to be made under the alternate Star Trek license, which means they will be legally separate from the original Star Trek canon. Even so, the deliberate strategy appears to be not only to market Discovery and the upcoming series as Prime, but also increase confusion by proclaiming them to be canon. As we saw earlier, one of Paramount's stated goals with restarting the Star Trek franchise was to get the licensing revenue going again. So far, that has not worked as well as they had hoped. Audiences have a preference for merchandise based on the likenesses of the original canon, not the likenesses associated with the alternate Star Trek. Despite Paramount asking them to, CBS had no intention of stopping to license the original canon Star Trek to third parties. 
thereby precluding Paramount and Bad Robot Star Trek from being the only Star Trek available to consumers. It was the frustration over this very situation that caused J.J. Abrams to jump ship and take on Star Wars instead. While Paramount and Bad Robot can't prevent CBS from licensing the likenesses associated with the original canon, they can blur the lines in the public's perception of what canon is. From a legal point of view, the border between what is the traditional canon and what isn't is a clear-cut one. Everything made under the original Star Trek license is canon, and everything made under the alternate license is not. Although, the alternate Star Trek arguably has a separate canon of its own. But the legal border between the two Star Treks is one thing, the audience's perception of it is another. And that perception can be blurred. The instrument for blurring it is the same one which kicked off the 2009 movie, Parallel Universes and Alternate Timelines. Between the Kelvin Timeline, Prime Timeline, and Mirror Universe, we have already seen three parallel universes on screen under the alternate Star Trek. And one of the points of featuring the Mycelial Network in Season 1 was establishing that there are countless others. This multiverse of alternate timelines and parallel universes has also been a recurring theme in the comics, which not only explicitly tie in with the Kelvin movies and Star Trek Discovery, but which Alex Kurtzman has consulted on. About Alex Kurtzman, up until recently, he ran the CBS All Access Star Trek operation as he saw fit. In December of 2018, however, John Van Sitters was promoted to the position of Vice President of Star Trek Brand Management at CBS. We do not know at this time the details of the working relationship between him and Kurtzman, nor do we know Van Sitters' strategy for Star Trek going forward. What we do know is that one month prior to be given this position, Van Sitters tweeted, What if the multiverse is real and all Star Trek stories are canon? This idea was enthusiastically co-signed by Star Trek author David Galantner. This is also very much in line with Paramount and Bad Robot's alleged intentions for the future of Star Trek, as it implies that the original Star Trek canon is but one timeline in an infinite multiverse. To further this perception, there are even rumors that more imagery from the original canon may be licensed for screen use further down the line and that universe-altering events may transpire to make it appear as if the Prime Universe is going to sync up with the canon Star Trek. In the real world, of course, there is no Star Trek multiverse, only the CBS-owned canon Star Trek and the Paramount-licensed alternate Star Trek. But the alleged purpose of this would be to further the perception among the audience that all of Star Trek is really but one big canon, for the ultimate goal of legitimizing and selling more merchandise under the alternate Star Trek license. It is further rumored that the intention is for absolutely all future Star Trek incarnations from here on out to be made under the alternate Star Trek license, while the original Star Trek canon remains dormant forever. Under the reign of Les Moonves, CBS didn't just not fight this, they may have even contributed towards it. Before he was summarily fired over Me Too allegations back in the summer of 2018 and subsequently denied his severance pay, Moonves gave Kurtzman the mission to oversee Star Trek for the next five years but it remains unknown if anything else that might have repercussions for the future of Star Trek was also agreed to. The production deal between Paramount and Bad Robot is soon coming to an end, so some speculate that Moonves might have given them, directly or indirectly, a stake in Star Trek which is not contingent upon Paramount, but we have not been able to confirm this. Regardless, these plans for the future of the franchise all rode on one thing. The alternate Star Trek had to be, at the very least, moderately successful. If there has been one thing that the alternate iteration of the Star Trek franchise has not been in the last few years, it is successful, not even moderately. To find more details on why not, as well as the detailed history and complexity of the Star Trek right situation and what may happen to the canon of Star Trek in the future, we invite you to check out the full video, which this was an excerpt of, the link for which is in the description. If you like this video, then please help share it and share your opinion in the comments. Midnight's Edge aims to give the most comprehensive analysis and commentary on genre culture and entertainment. If you would like to see more of our videos, then please subscribe, hit the bell icon, and remember to indicate that you would like to be notified when new videos are uploaded. If you really like what we do, then please support us on Patreon until a better alternative comes along, or send us a direct donation through PayPal. Also check out our sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark for live shows and other rants. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and stay tuned for more here at Midnight's Edge.